Right, ladies and gentlemen, let's continue with chapter 11 in the textbook of Single and Kajar. Chapter 11 is on heat exchanges, and it's the last chapter that we're going to do before the exam. And in my opinion, it is actually the most uh, chapter with the, with the nicest work, with the best applications in industry. And it's a very practical chapter, and it shows where many of the work actually gets together. So, heat exchangers, what is a heat exchanger? Well, there's a definition in your textbook, but the definition in general says that there are three things which are necessary. First thing is it's going to facilitate a heat transfer, and the heat transfer is always between two streams, and the two streams, the inlet temperatures of the two streams, T1 is the one stream, T2 is the other stream, and I and I indicates the inner temperature of the two streams are at different tempers, temperatures. So uh, it means that T1 inlet is not equal to T2 inlet, the different temperatures. And then thirdly, there should be no mixing of the two streams. So we should keep the two streams apart. If that doesn't happen, then it's not a heat exchanger. Let's look at the different types of heat exchangers from the most basic to the more complicated ones. And as we go to the more complicated ones, I'm going to show you some PowerPoint slides which are much easier to explain and to show because it's quite difficult in many, in many cases to show on the board how it looks like. So, in general, there are two different types of heat exchangers in terms of, it, in terms of its sim the simplest type. The first type is where we've got a tube, or, and it can be a circular tube, it might be square, it doesn't matter. And this tube, <coughs> let's suppose, have a hot stream coming in, <coughs> but then it has an annulus, and in the annulus, there will be a different stream at another temperature. So here we can see we've got, there will be a heat transfer because the two temperatures are the different temperatures and they do not mix. So this type of heat exchanger, we are going to call a parallel heat exchanger. Parallel heat exchanger and then the other one would be sort of the opposite of that. Again, one stream within another one. There is the inlet stream at a high temperature, and there will be the other one in the annulus. You can also show it like that. Okay. In an opposite direction, and this is called a counterflow heat exchanger counterflow because the directions are different from each other in comparison with the one where they flow in the same direction. If we look at the heat transfer characteristics of these two streams, then they are quite different. With a parallel flow, you're going to get something like this. That is a stream like that. The hot fluid and the cold fluid is going to do something like that. While well, with a counterflow heat exchanger, it is going to be something like that. And the cold fluid is going to do something like that. So the difference is that with a parallel flow heat exchanger, the heat transfer rate, so that this temperature is a function of x, temperature is a function of x. So with a parallel flow heat exchanger, we see that the temperature difference in the beginning is very high. So there's a high heat transfer rate, but then the heat transfer rate decreases in the direction of the flow. While with a parallel flow one, the temperature, this temp temperature difference 
is not constant, but you will see that the temperature difference in general is bigger than that of the parallel flow heat exchanger. And for that reason, this heat exchanger is more effective than that one. And we will get to that in terms of defining it and quantifying it in a latter part of this chapter. But in general, with this chapter, we are now going to do an introduction. We are going to look at the different types of heat exchangers. We are going to look at a little bit in terms of our mathematical approach, in terms of the heat transfer rate. And then after that, we are going to see that there are two different types of approaches that can be used to solve the heat transfer in different types of heat exchangers. And the first approach is going to call, be called the LMTD approach. The LMTD approach. And the second approach is going to be the effectiveness NTU approach. You've already learned about NTUs, so you know what it is. And today, we're going to spend on the types, the mathematical approach. The next lecture is going to be on the LMTD, and then the next lecture after that on the effectiveness NTU approach. OK, so that is a general, very simple introduction in terms of the different types of heat exchangers. These are the most simplest one, and in many cases, they are the cheapest ones that can be made very, very quickly and easily. However, although they are fine if we've got heat transfer rates up to a few kilowatts, when we start getting to tens of kilowatts or hundreds of kilowatts, then normally the length that we require is starting to get too much. And for that reason, we are going to introduce what we call uh, the area density when we start looking at heat exchangers which are compact. And when we start looking at compact heat exchanger, there's a definition for it, and that is called the area density. And this definition says it is the heat transfer rate of the surface area divided by the volume of the heat exchanger. The surface of heat transfer, so in this case, it will be the surface here, divided by its volume, and for that reason, the units will always be square meter per cubic meter. Now let me show you a typical compact heat exchanger. There's the one in your car, typically in most cars, is quite compact. Why do you want it to be compact? Because if it's not compact, you know, then you're going to spend a much, much more area on the heat exchangers. It's going to increase the volume inside the, the engine compartment. And in many cases, the weight is also very important. We want it to be as small as possible and as light as possible. And for that reason, more and more car radiators are being made of plastic. And we will get to the rationale of this a little bit later. Many of you or people in general would say, no, that's not a good idea. It shouldn't be plastic. The heat exchanger should rather, rather be made from copper because there are, there's a higher thermal conductivity. So for example, if we look at this heat exchanger, for the parallel flow and the counter flow, the reaction of many people would be, now let's make it from copper or something that conducts heat so that the heat transfer rate through the wall can be, can be very high. But the rationale why we in many cases do not do that, I will get to that a little bit later. So in terms of compact heat exchangers, there's an example of it. And let me see if I can show you another example. There's another one, which is called a printed circuit heat exchanger. Uh, you will see some small channels there. Those channels um, are chemically etched, typically of one to three millimeter in height or diameter. 
uh, the material that is being used are normally stainless steel, titanium, copper and nickel, etc. those types of materials. Uh, they can uh, uh, maintain or very high pressures, 5 MPa and larger, so that's normally very high. And the area density is approximately 2,500 square meters per cubic meter. So in one cubic meter, the area which is available for the heat transfer is a massive 2,500. So the moment it is more than that, it is considered as a compact heat exchanger. The channels, although you can't see it, in many cases are zigzag. They don't just go through in one direction. They would typically move like that, or they are S-shaped, or aerofoiled, many, many things or techniques which are being used to actually expose the area for the heat transfer. Now when we start looking at compact heat exchanges, you can go to higher and higher and higher values and maybe there's somebody that can tell me which type of heat exchanger has the highest um, area density or which heat exchanger is the most effective. Anybody knows? Yep. Uh, plate. plate heat exchangers, yes, they are very high, but there is one that is much higher than that, and every one of you have one. Lungs. Sorry, the lungs, yes. The lungs by far, are by far the most effective types of heat exchanger, and what actually happens in your lungs is there's not only a transfer of the oxygen, but there's all, it's a heat exchanger. On your body, the surface is cooler than on the inside. Uh, on the inside, obviously, your temperature is 37. But on the surface, it's not. So your lungs actually help to cool the blood internally in your body. And that is typically what is being indicated there, that you can see the blood in red, which is hot when it goes in and it is being cooled by the air on the side. Now those, the, the human lung has an area density of 20,000 square meters per cubic meter. 20,000 square meters per cubic meter, so it's very, very dense, there's no, uh, other heat exchanger that we can manufacture with a higher uh, density than that. And because the, the diameters are just getting smaller and smaller, the flow starts being laminar and you end up with something like that. The red obviously indicates the high temperatures and the blue, the lower temperatures where the heat transfer takes place. And if you would like to read about it, you know, typically uh, they are, the, the, the wall thicknesses are one cell thickness. That's typically the wall thickness that you're talking of when, when it starts becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. And there is approximately, let me see if I can see that, um, yeah, five to ten microns. And there are 300 million of these Alavolis in a normal lung. Okay, so that is quite a number of heat exchanges that you have, 300 million in your lungs. So that's great. Okay. Now the next type of heat exchanger is the so-called, as you've mentioned, the plate heat exchanger. It's not it yet, we will get to it just now. <coughs> Excuse me. But what you can see there on the left-hand side is some tubes uh, that can be the hot fluid or the cold fluid. Just going back to what I've showed there with the parallel flow heat exchangers and the counter flow heat exchangers. In those cases, the hot fluid is in the inner tube and the cold fluid is on the out in the annulus. But you can do it the other way around also. So it doesn't have to be like that. And here the same. So you've, you can have the hot fluid or the cold fluid flowing through those tubes, and there you can have another fluid, and it would go between the plates, and for that reason it is called an unmixed heat exchanger, because it is not being mixed in the, in the, in the lateral direction, 
and these ones are also not being mixed. While with this one, we've got the tubes here, and typically air, which are being forced over it with a fan, and then the heat transfer will occur, but in this direction, the, the temperatures may vary, and for that reason, it is called a mixed heat exchanger. In most cases, and this is a very important thing, where we want to do heat transfer and air is involved, and that happens a lot in mechanical engineering, then air has a very small heat transfer coefficient in general, and that's the reason why we use fins. So the fins on the outside is typically how you get in many condensers and evaporators in the HVAC industry. By using fins, we can increase the area on the one side, normally the gas side. The, 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 the moment there is a gas involved, then in most cases we might use of a fin. And the gas or the air can be natural convection or it can be forced convection where we normally use a fan. So those are normally the two different cases. Right, the next type of heat exchanger is the shell and tube heat exchanger. It's a very popular type of heat exchanger and a very effective one. Um, however, normally it's not something that you'll get in your car. It is not something that you'll get into your laptop because normally they are very heavy. So although they are very effective, they are very heavy and, for that, and, and quite expensive, especially when you start making them very small. At the moment when you start talking of hundreds of kilowatts, in most cases that is a, the type of heat exchanger that you'll be very interested in. So if you can look here very carefully, you will see that there's a so-called shell. Let me rather show it to you, to you here in principle. <coughs> so we've got a shell. Typically look, look, it's look, it typically looks like that. And then it has an inlet like that and an outlet like that. And the one stream is going to go in there and it is going to go out there. So that is called a shell. Okay. And then we are going to have some, here we typically have a header. So this is called the header and the header. And here we are going to have some tubes like that. I'm just going to draw three of them, not very neatly. Um, I should have drawn it a little bit different, sorry. Let me rather put it here, like that. There, like that. And let me use the red to indicate the hot fluid going in there and going out there. So this fluid is going to move through these areas here, okay, on the outside of all these tubes, and then it has to flow out there. While here we're going to have, let's put it in here, the flow through the, through the other tubes, like that, and it's going to go in, let's choose that direction and that direction. So now you can see this fluid is going to flow through the header, and then it's going to flow through all these tubes like that, in this direction, and that is how you've got the shell and tube heat exchanger. So that's where the name comes from. Now, although that in principle shows the heat exchanger, that in general would be not that effective. So for that reason, we would typically put in baffle plates here. So we would put in a baffle plate like that. Why? Because this baffle plate is now going to force the flow to be almost perpendicular to this flow direction. It's going to go through there. And then we will put, have another baffle plate going like that, which is then going to force the flow like that. And in general, we make the flow path longer and 
the amount of heat that it will be exposed to is getting more and more. Now, there are many, many different types of configurations that can be used. You don't need to recall it all out of your head. And schematically, they will be shown in the textbook a little bit later. But in general, that is how it looks like. That's a sketch that I've tried to make there on the board. It is in your textbook. This is how it looks like. You'll see they are massive when they, when they are being manufactured. There are thousands of tubes. Uh, there's the, uh, the header, for example. There are the tubes that need to go into this uh, uh, shell and tube heat exchanger. And if you look carefully, you will see those plates there are the baffle plates that I'm referring to. And that is the shell and tube heat exchanger. The next type of heat exchanger is the, is the plate and frame heat exchanger, normally for lower pressure. Because we've got these large areas, you've got normally a pressure difference between the two streams. And this pressure difference causes a lot of forces. So you can typically use these types of heat exchangers, uh, typically in the chemical industry and also in the milk industry, where milk is being pasteurized. Temperature differences are not that big. And the very nice thing about it is in many cases, you know your requirements or operating conditions change throughout the years, and then you can just add some more plates or you can take some of them out to change the capacity of the heat exchanger. If you look carefully, you will see that there are some different patterns on all the plates. They do not always have to be in a frame. In many cases, they can be framed. They can be uh, not... Um, uh, they can be braced to, to make them leak-proof. You, you can also get, get it like that. But in general, for relatively low pressure differences between the two streams. So, in general, many, many different types of heat exchangers. I showed you that one previously there with a, with, a, with, a, with a plate heat exchanger. You can, in general, see the flow directions. They are in opposite directions from each other. So they are quite complicated in terms of sealing them, making sure that the one fluid do not leak towards the other one. And typically, that is how the plates look like. So inside the plates, except for the fact that the flow in general goes, the one flow path stream is in one direction, and the other one in the opposite direction, they are also channeled so that they move zigzag through the heat exchanger. Many of those heat exchangers, the patterns have been developed to, to make sure that the flow is very turbulent because that actually enhances the heat transfer. However, nature always gives you a curve ball, and that is if the heat transfer increases, your pressure drop increases. You cannot disconnect the two. Nature makes sure that that doesn't happen. The next type of heat exchanger is the regenerative type of heat exchanger. In general, it is just a big porous media, like that. And you can have a temperature stream. Let me use the blue and the red again. Let's suppose you've got a hot stream, and then you will let it go through the porous media. You will increase the temperature of the porous media. So that would be at time equal zero. And then at time equal to delta T, you're going to have another stream that flows through the porous media. And that is how you transfer the heat from the one stream to the other stream. In this case, there's a discontinuity in the sense that you have to stop the hot stream and then the cold one and then the hot one and the cold one. Well, how can you solve that problem? Very easy. And that is called with a dynamic one where this porous media rotates in a certain direction and then you separate the two streams from each other like that. And what you then can do is you can have the hot stream 
flowing on this side and the cold stream on that side. And that is how you can transfer the heat from the one stream to the other stream. Okay. Any questions? You all understand? Okay. There are many, many more different types of heat exchangers. However, we are not going to look in detail at all of them, the advantages and the disadvantages. You're going to have a general approach, and it doesn't matter which type of heat exchanger we are going to consider, we would like to solve all of them. Okay, now solving it means that we need to understand how the heat transfer takes place. And that is actually very easy. You have done it all. So let's consider the case where you've got two different types of walls. In this case, a cylindrical one, typically as you will have in the parallel heat exchanger or the counterflow heat exchanger. So we are looking at that wall. And always the heat transfer can be written in terms of three resistance terms, like that. So that would be the temperature on the inside, Ti, and TO would be the temperature on the outside. If the inner temperature is higher than that temperature, then the heat transfer will occur in that direction. If this one is higher than that one, it will just flow in the other direction. So that's very easy. In general, okay, and this is now going to be the same. It's just the geometry that's going to differ. Okay. But in general, that is inside, that's outside, and that's the wall. Inside, outside, and the wall. Now, you've already done it in the first three chapters in the textbook of Sengel and Kajar. How do you solve these types of problems? Well, it's very easy. You just look at the total resistance, which is going to be the resistance of the inside, the resistance of the wall, and the resist resistance of the outside. And normally, the inside resistance we can write as 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the inside multiplied by the area on the inside plus the resistance of the wall, which can look a little bit different because of the geometry. In the case where it is a cylindrical type of geometry, then that the resistance is the limb of the diameter ratio divided by 2 pi kL plus the resistance on the outside, which is equal to 1, divided by the heat transfer on the outside and the area on the outside. <coughs> and of course, the area on the inside would be equal to pi multiplied by the diameter on the inside multiplied by the length of this, of that area. So in that direction, it would be the length L. So that's the heat transfer area. And of course, the outside area would be equal to pi, the diameter of the outside multiplied by the length. They will have the same length. OK, now this is the case for this type of geometry. If we have this type of geometry, then that's this term should be equal to um, let's call this um, distance t, small t. Then it would be equal to t, the thickness divided by k, and the area. where this area would now be equal to, let's suppose that is equal to z. That area would then be equal to z multiplied by L. 
L will of course be this direction in that inside into the board. Do you understand? Do you still remember it? It's very easy. The same as what you've done in second year air and electrotechnics course. <coughs> Okay, so those are the resistances. So what about the heat transfer rate? So in general, for all two of these equations, the heat transfer rate would be equal to delta T divided by the total resistance. And delta T would be the inlet temperature minus the outer temperature divided by the total resistance. Okay, so in terms of how to characterize any type of heat exchanger, you can see what you need is the geometry. You need, in terms of the geometry, the thicknesses, the diameters, etc. You need the material which is being used, copper or plastic or whatever it is. And then you also need the heat transfer coefficient on the inside and the outside. And if you would now go and design a heat exchanger for industry, and you do some experiments, you would like to provide the information to potential customers. So yes, what you can do is you can go and characterize the heat exchanger for different heat transfer coefficients on the inside and the outside, but most of your clients would actually like to know one thing. <laughs> okay. And that is they actually want you to put everything together. And if you put everything together, what you're then going to do is you're going to say, let's rather write the heat transfer rate as, yes, it is equal to delta T divided by R total, but it is equal to UA multiplied by delta T, where the area is the surface area. So if I can put in a catalog those values, UA, then I provide everything to the client that he needs. Okay. However, you have to be careful because there is something that you have to be very careful for. And I'm going to show it specifically for this case. It is not relevant to this case, but it's very relevant to this case. So UA, we can write it as the overall heat transfer coefficient for the inside multiplied by delta T is equal to the overall heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area delta T. So we can look at it at the inside and the outside. The product of all of them will be the same. However, so that is equal to that. Okay. But, The inside overall heat transfer coefficient is not equal to the outside one. So if you see in a catalog the overall heat transfer coefficient, or if you want to put it into a catalog, you always have to say which area is being used to determine the overall heat transfer coefficient. So in general, that is not so unless, unless, the inside area is equal to the outside area. So if that is equal to that, then they are equal. But in general, as you can see, it is not the case. That area and that area is not the same. However, they will start being the same if the thickness is very small. So if this thickness is very, very small, then you've got that special condition. And so, by the way, that is actually what happens in your car radiator made from plastic. Because if that ratio, if that is very thin, then that is almost equal to 1. You agree? And the ln of 1 is 0. So that's the first reason why this resistance becomes negligible. So it doesn't matter what material the heat exchanger is made from. <laughs> if it's plastic or stainless steel or copper or whatever, it doesn't matter. If it's, the wall thickness is very small, 
You can ignore the resistance through the wall. So many engineers in industry, when they want the heat exchanger to perform better, the first thing they think of is, well, let me, let me rather change the material to copper or something else with a high thermal conductivity. It's not going to help at all because this resistance is then negligible. The resistance is actually going to be with the other two terms. <coughs> so with U, so always specify the area. Except if the two areas are exactly the same. So in general, that can be a very special condition. And that special condition is if the wall thickness, I've used W there for wall thickness. Let me use W there also for wall thickness. If the wall thickness if the wall thickness is small, Secondly, when K is high, then, or, sorry, or when the inside area, third condition, when the inside area is equal to the outside area, then in general we can say one divided by the overall heat transfer coefficient is equal to 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the inside plus 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the outside. Let's look at this again. If it's W is small, then that is going to be approximately 1 or no, 0 0.999 something. The lin of that is 0. So if that is 0, then it normally means it's very thin, then the inside area is equal to the outside area, and there you can see your areas disappear, and your equation becomes very simple. Now, not always. In many cases with the heat exchanger problems that you're going to do in this chapter, you might be lucky and it reduces to this, which means that you need to do much less calculations. But you always have to go and check, and you have to be sure about it. Now, let's also look at, and I'm going to emphasize that a lot, and that is when you, we're going to do calculations, and in industry, in many cases, you will put this into a numerical program or an Excel spreadsheet, and depending on the geometry, you're just going to get the answer. Okay. But if you just get the answer, you do not really understand the problem well. So it's very important that you actually go and calculate the three terms. Or then in any case, even if this one is zero, that you need to use some engineering judgment to understand what is actually happening. And I'm going to show it to you with two examples. Let's suppose you've got a case where you've got that. So that would be the case where the heat transfer coefficient on the inside is 3. It is small. If it is small, the heat transfer coefficient on the inside, if this value is small, that resistance is large. You see that? A large resistance. Comparison with the heat transfer coefficient of 1,000. If it's 1,000, if it's a thousand, there's a big value there, the resistance is small. You see? Okay, now let's suppose the thermal conductivity is high and uh, what did we say? W. W is small. It means this resistance is negligible. So if you would now go and calculate 1 divided by U, which should be 1 divided by 3 plus 1 divided by 
1,000, you're going to get the overall heat transfer coefficient is equal to 2.99 watts per square meter degree Celsius. Okay. It's just a calculation, <laughs> but that thing tells you something very important. And that is that this problem, with this problem, this value actually determines or controls the problem. Because the 3 and the 2.91 are about the same. Okay. Well, let's do the opposite. Here we've got one now with a very high heat transfer coefficient. Again, the wall resistance very small. So in this case, the heat transfer coefficient is 5,000. This one, very thin wall. And the heat transfer coefficient is 10, typically that of air, natural convection. If you go and calculate, 1 divided by the overall resistance, that it is 1 divided by 5,000 plus Okay, zero plus one divided by 10. If you go and calculate the overall heat transfer coefficient, then the overall heat transfer coefficient is equal to 9.98 watts per square meter degree Celsius. Right, so why do I emphasize this? I emphasize this because your engineering judgment is important. If you just go through all the calculations, you're not really going to understand that if I need to make this heat exchanger to be more effective, then it doesn't matter what I'm going to do there. It doesn't matter what I'm going to do here. This is my problem. I should give attention to that value because the 10 and the 9.98 is about the same. So the overall resistance is being determined in many cases by the value with the lowest heat transfer coefficient. Now, of course, that is not always the case. There might be cases where you have things which are more balanced. So this value is, for example, 5,000, and this value is approximately 4,000. Okay. Then the overall heat transfer coefficient is not going to be approximately 4,000 going to be something in between. You understand? Okay. Now there are two other scenarios that we need to think of when we design heat exchangers. But in principle, it is always the effect of the inlet resistance, the wall resistance, and the outside resistance. <coughs> Now, it doesn't matter how good we design heat exchangers. In many cases, after 10 or 20 years, you're going to get to your heat exchanger and it is not going to operate as it should. Why not? Firstly, or not firstly, in general, you'll get some fouling. Okay? And the fouling can be on the inside and the outside, or in general, one of the two. Normally, something like an air conditioning condenser, which is on the outside of a building, with time, some dust will collect on it. You can just go and look at some of them. Leaves would go into the fins, etc. So that needs to be taken care of. And we do that by very simply looking at the resistance term, the total resistance, and we say it is equal to uh, one divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the inside, the area on the inside, the resistance of the wall, plus one divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the outside, the heat transfer coefficient on the outside multiplied by the area on the outside. Now let's suppose it is something like an air conditioning condenser, then the dust would typically appear on the outside, and for that we need a fouling resistance, that we also need to take into consideration. 
And normally, an air conditioning one are very, very clean, and there will not be any fouling on the inside of the heat exchanger. However, if it is a steam, a steam one, then normally you will get some scaling because of the water, and then you can have a resistance on the inside also. So, very simple how to take that into consideration. What is not so simple is to get the values for the inside fouling and the outside fouling. Now, in your textbook in table 11.2, different values are given for fouling. For example, on the air side of a heat exchanger, then the RF value in terms of the units, square meters per Kelvin, or square meters Kelvin per watt, Typically for air, it is 0 0.304. It's not that much, but it is there. And then, if you work with water, and it is smaller than 50 degrees Celsius, then it would be in the order of 0 0.0001. Although those values are given in your textbook, they are just to give you an indication that for detailed design work you will have to go to literature and you will get some and you will need to get some much better values. However, if the temperature increases to more than 50, then normally you're going to get scaling and then this value would easily double. So those are the typical values for fouling and how you can take that into consideration. So it's very simple. You look if the fouling is on the inside or the outside. If it's only on the outside, then you need to take it into, into consideration with that term. If it's only on the inside, you need to take it into consideration with, the, with that one. In the very unusual cases where you've got fouling on the inside and the outside, then you can take it, then you can do the calculation for the inside resistance and the outside resistance. Right. Now, there's one more special case that we have to look at, and that is what I've mentioned, is that when you have a heat, a heat exchanger, and one of the streams, or both of the streams, are a gas. Gases, in general, have a very low heat transfer coefficient. It has to do with the thermal conductivity. But we as engineers, in many cases, need to use the environment either as a heat source or a heat sink. So, we rely on the air in many, many cases. If you go and look at many, many big air conditioning, heating and air HVAC conditions, as well as in the chemical industry, you will see it a lot. So how do we take it into consideration when one of the surfaces or both are fins? Now, typically, schematically, if I can show the fins like this, that you've also done in the first three chapters of your textbook, where we here have one of the areas, this area or that area, or both of them. If we've got fins, we need to use the surface area. The surface area should be the area of the fin plus the area of the infant, the infant areas. Let me just show you which ones they are. Okay, the front area would be that area there. So that area plus that area there. And of course, that area there. I've just shown three fins. And I've never seen a heat exchanger with only three fins. Normally, there are hundreds of them. Okay. Plus, the infant areas. The infant areas is the areas in between. So you need to add all those areas together, and you've got the infant area. And the resistance would then be equal to the efficiency of the fin multiplied by... <coughs> 
the area of the fin plus the area of the infant. Okay. So you need to take the fin efficiency into consideration. I hope you can still remember that. But there are some lots of tables and conditions. But in general, for an isothermal fin, which means that the temperature right through the fin is this, at the same temperature, then the efficiency would be equal to 1. So that is the type of fin that we normally would like to use with any heat exchanger. Okay. So again, if you've got fins on the inside and the outside, then you need to do it for the inside and the outside. If it's only for one side, you do it on that, on that one. Now, a question that many of you are going to get in the test and exam is when you get a fin area, then the issue with many students is, you know, where does this area start? What if it starts there, and it ends there, etc. The important thing to remember is normally if you've got fins, as I've mentioned, you are talking of large numbers. You're not talking of 10, it's normally 100 or something like that. And on 100 fins, where you stop there is not going to be important. <laughs> So you can really take that last area, you can ignore it for your calculations. It is not going to have any influence on your calculations. Right, ladies and gentlemen, that was an introductory session on heat exchangers. And with the next lecture, we will start with the LMTD method. Thank you very much.